you open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7, please? Matthew chapter 7. You'll see as you uh, open up to that text that this is nearing the end of Jesus' famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, which is the greatest ethical teaching in human history. In this sermon, Jesus teaches us what it means to live with God as your king, to obey God, to be in the kingdom of heaven. And near the end of the sermon, in chapter 7, Jesus presents a series of choices with only two options. It's very binary language here at the end. Do you see in chapter 6, verses 19 to 23, the option between two treasures? Are you going to be the kind of person that is just thinking about this world and you're just laying up treasure on earth? Well, he tells you what's going to happen to your treasure if you do that. So he tells you to choose to lay up treasure in heaven. Uh, then he, he gives the choice in verse 24 of two masters. Are you going to serve God or are you going to serve money? Because you can't do both at the same time. Then at the end of chapter 6, he talks about two what we might call ambitions. Are you going to set your mind on serving yourself and trying to solidify your own security and living for your own comfort? Or are you going to serve God in his kingdom and let that be your priority in life? Well, here in our text, in verses, uh, chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, the choice is between two gates, one that is wide and another that is narrow, that open up onto two lanes or two roads. One is easy to walk on, the other is hard. And each of those roads are populated by two groups of people. One group is very large and the other is very small. And those, le those roads lead to two different destinations. Destruction on the one hand and life on the other. Let's read those together. Chapter 7, 13 and 14. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. So this theme here of inescapable decision runs throughout the sermon, and you begin to see the climax here at the end. If you're not a Christian, you don't like this. <laughs> this is culturally unpalatable stuff, because we like to believe there are more than just two choices in life, that really all roads lead to heaven, or at least your version of it. And as long as you're a good person, that's really all that matters. It really doesn't matter what kind of religion that you have or that you have one at all. And to say otherwise would be the height of arrogance, or you would be an extremist to think, think this. And so our culture prefers the, the, the ethic of uh, Aristotle. We want to live a walk on his famous via media, the golden way. This sort of middle road. We don't want to be too far extreme this way or that way. We don't want to be too virtuous because that would lead to this or that. We don't want to be too committed because it would lead to this or that. We want to live by that Greek maxim, nothing in excess. That, now that, that resonates in our culture, doesn't it? Jesus is so different. He's so different. And his voice cuts through all of our religious syncretism. And he speaks in this binary language. Listen, not everything is black and white in life, but some things are. And it's high time our culture recognizes that. Everyone will understand what this sermon is about by the end. This is very simple stuff. I won't probably be teaching you anything new here but it's worth talking about. There are two roads, first of all. Now, the reason why I had Grant read Psalm 1 
is because Jesus is using a particular Jewish metaphor of life as a journey, right? We're walking, we're progressing, we're moving. That's the Jewish understanding of life. Life is this highway, it's this road we're traveling on. And the choice in Psalm 1 is between the way of the righteous who delight in God's law, they bear fruit, they prosper, versus the way of the wicked who are driven like chaff before the wind and they perish. And so Jesus, I think, is riffing on that a little bit here. Uh, he describes these two ways, these two roads, as easy and hard. Now, the first road, it's easy. It's easy to, to travel on because your Bible even might say, literally, it's broad. It's spacious. There's nothing to confine you in this way of living. There's nothing to cramp your style. There's plenty of room for diversity of beliefs and diversity of, of ethics. This is the road of tolerance. This is the road of permissiveness where all views are equal and acceptable and there's no judgment whatsoever. There's no boundaries on this road. There's no guardrails on your thinking and on your behavior. And everybody minds his own business Everybody does his own thing, and there's no one to interfere with you or tell you how you ought to live. But this road, it gently slopes downhill so that you could just idle your way through life, and you could be making progress downhill. Or if you liked a different metaphor, you could be floating with the current of the world, and you don't have to put forth any exertion whatsoever. You don't have to think about anything too hard. You don't have to really uh, ask yourself any kind of difficult questions or really be quick critical of your own life at all. Postmodern people are very comfortable here because it agrees with their ideas of freedom. Freedom is freedom from rules. It's freedom from restrictions. Self is the chief thing. Personal happiness is the number one consideration. Personal comfort. But then there's the hard road. This is, this is difficult to travel on this road because your version might say it's narrow. It's literally compressed, this road. And the reason why is because there are boundaries on this road. There are guardrails clearly marked and defined by God's Word. And it restricts travelers to what God has revealed to be true and good. Because once we recognize there's objective truth, that truth puts limitations on our thinking and our behavior. Have you ever read C.S. Lewis's book, Surprised by Joy? It's about his journey from atheism to Christianity. And he talks about when he was a, uh, a boy of the age of 13, he began to broaden his mind, he says. I'll quote from the book. I was soon altering I believe to one does feel, and oh, the relief of it. From the tyrannous noon of revelation, God's word, I passed into the cool evening twilight of higher thought where there was nothing to be obeyed and nothing to be believed except what was either comforting or exciting. Again, does that not resonate in our culture? Think about social media. Think about how it's driven. It is literally driven by likes and dislikes, by emojis, Emo, emotions, emotive icons, how you feel, right? Never mind objective truth. It's all subjective, it's all relative. But people who are walking on the hard or narrow way, they don't travel by how they feel, they travel by what God says. They're submissive to the Word. And they use that word as a map for their lives, as a guide, and they're constantly checking back with that word and, and looking at their life in comparison and recalibrating it based upon what they learn. See, whereas the, the easy, broad road gently slopes downhill, the hard, narrow road, it's uphill. Sometimes it's rather steep. 
And it requires a lot of effort and purpose to stay on it and continue moving. So in that sense, it's, it's hard because there are restrictions. Yet, could we add a little nuance to this by turning to a different passage in Matthew chapter 11, just a couple of pages over? Because there's another sense in which this is really easy. Look at what Jesus says at the end of Matthew 11. He invites people who are introspective and who are tired of living a life of sin. And he says to these people with, with the utmost compassion and love for them, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. You know, a yoke is this wooden frame that's placed over the neck of an oxen or something to, to pull a cart or to, to plow a field or something like that. And that yoke is a metaphor to signify submission to authority. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. It won't grate against your neck. I'm gentle and lowly. It's a kindness to you. So in the picture, Jesus is the farmer, we're the oxen, and when we allow him to govern us, when we take his yoke upon us and we submit to him, what do we find? Not a life of hardship and difficulty, but we find rest. We find freedom. So we need to bring these two texts together and see the nuance of what he's talking about. Christ's way is hard. It's hard in the sense that we have to swallow our pride and submit to His rule if we're going to walk in His way. But don't you see the other side of it? That it's easy in the sense that His rule frees us to live the best, fullest life possible. The way of the transgressor is really hard, isn't it? What would you rather have? Would you rather do the right thing and suffer temporarily for it? Or would you rather do the wrong thing and suffer now and forever for it? This is what Jesus came to do. He came to set the captive free because we're enslaved by our own passions. And he teaches us freedom from, from envy and materialism and covetousness. To, to teach us things like contentment and, and joy and, and love. He teaches us, you know, he brings us uh, freedom from, from being a slave to our passions of lust and greed, right? By teaching us the freedom of, of finding true life and true meaning and purpose and direction in Him. Make me a captive, Lord, and then I shall be free. Force me to render up my sword, and I shall conqueror be. There are two roads. Are there three roads? No, there are two roads. And there are two crowds. Each, each road is populated with two groups of people. There's the large crowd. The easy road is busy. It's like a highway with everybody on cruise control. And those who enter by it, he says, are many. Because most people don't want to sing trust and obey. They want to sing another song. Uh, from the words of that blue-eyed sage, I've lived a life that's full. I've traveled each and every highway and much more, much more than this. I did it my way. The hard road is comparatively empty because those who find it are few, he says. What is Jesus saying? He's anticipating that the people who turn to him, his followers, are going to be in the minority. And we know by experience, and we know by what Jesus teaches us in other places, that the people who accept the gospel message will always be fewer than those who reject it. Now, the point here, I don't think, is to be preoccupied with determining the number of people who are saved versus the number of people who, are, who aren't saved. Rather, the point is we need to be concerned with being the people that are the few who find that hard road, right? Right? to make the conscious effort to walk on the road that he's telling us to walk on. In support of that, look at some other a parallel to this in Luke chapter 13. In Luke 13, in verse 23 and 24, some said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? And he said to them, in verse 24, 
strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Don't preoccupy yourself with the number of saved versus the number of condemned. You, you show purpose and determination to be the few who find that road. Well, why would we want to travel on a road that is hard and a road that's desolate? Because of where the road leads, right? Because there are two crowds traveling on two roads and they are leading to two destinations. So the two ways of the psalm, did you notice when, when Grant was reading where the way of the wicked went and the way of the righteous went? The, the, the way of the righteous went to prospering, whereas the way of the wicked went to perishing. Well, this turns out to be kind of a theme in the Bible. Moses, before uh, entering into the promised land, he told Israel to choose life and good or death and evil. Uh, Joshua did basically the same thing, right? In Joshua 24, uh, as he was kind of passing on and getting older in age, choose you this day who you're going to serve. You're going to serve God or you're going to serve these other idols, uh, idols of the nations. Jeremiah, when he's talking to the Israelites in Babylonian exile, he said the same thing, choose life or choose death. And really the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the Garden of Eden represented the very same choice between life and death. That's the choice that God puts before us. And this history of free will, this history of choice, culminates right here in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says the broad, easy, populated road leads to destruction. The narrow, hard, unpopulated road leads to life. Destruction. Now primarily, God is creator. That is his characteristic ability. That is his unique ability to create, to bring life, to give life. But yet, we also need to look at the other side of it. He's also a destroyer who has the ability to take life. Do we recognize that about our God? And is not life his to give and his to take away? Look at another passage in Matthew. Again, the words of Jesus, Matthew chapter 10. In verse 28, when he's encouraging his apostles to go out and to preach this good news, he tells them to be courageous. And he says in verse 28, Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Talk about culturally unpalatable. Now, we might debate certain aspects of hell because our knowledge is, you know, it's, it's limited by what God has revealed here, but there's certain things that aren't debatable. The certainty of its existence, the terror of it, and the permanence of those who enter it. It's the absence of God. And if God isn't present, then it's the absence of all that is good, all that is associated with God. Do we really think about that? An existence with no love, you'll never experience that again. An existence without beauty or peace or joy or rest or laughter or light or hope or truth. This is the worst prospect imaginable. And it strikes me that no one spoke more about hell, more often and more forcefully and with more clarity than Jesus himself. There are many people who refuse to believe that a loving God would ever condemn the objects of his love. And this merits much more discussion and we will get into that in our class on apologetics. I think there are strong philosophical arguments and scriptural arguments we can marshal in the defense of, of hell. But briefly, could you consider the other side of this? If God, we know that God is perfectly good and perfectly loving, but if God is perfectly holy and just in relation to human sin and moral responsibility, which is what the Bible teaches, then the existence of hell is not only rational, it's necessary. It is simply God honoring the choice 
of people who do not, who refuse his, his, his grace, right? who want to live apart from him. There are those who say, thy will be done to God, and there are those who say that, that God will say to them, thy will be done. So why did Jesus speak so often about this ugly thing? Why did he speak so forcefully about hell, if not to save people from it? If he, if he didn't talk about it, you'd be worried, right? He doesn't wish that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. He desires all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. He loved the people of Jerusalem. And he stood on the hill and he overlooked Jerusalem and he lamented over the fate of the city because they rejected his continual offer of redemption. Even as he died on the cross, he prays for the very people who drove the nails into his hands. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. So don't flippantly dismiss hell. And don't think that because Jesus talked about it, he's not loving. That's not being fair with what the Bible says. He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, O Israel? God is saying through the prophet Ezekiel. Jesus' mission is to get people off the broad, easy way leading to destruction and on to the narrow, hard way leading to life. And what kind of life is he offering? It's not just physical life. It's eternal life. And eternal life means even more than simply life continuing without end, right? Speaking of the temporal quality of life, but a, a life that's characteristic of that eternal age, a life characteristic of that age to come, a perfect life, a full life, life as God meant it to be, unstained by sin and darkness and evil and all the rest. That's why Jesus describes eternal life as knowing God and knowing Christ whom he had sent. It's perfect, full fellowship with God, being face to face with our creator who loves us and who made us for himself and for his glory. And there with him, he will dry every tear and the former things will pass away. Things like death, mourning, crying, pain, They'll pass away, and he'll make all things new. So that's the end. But where does it all start? We talked about the roads. We talked about the people that travel on them and where they go, where they end up. But where does it begin? Well, Jesus describes the access to these two roads that lead to these two destinations with these two gates. So the gate opening onto the easy road, it's wide. What does that signify to us? Well, that it's, it's wide enough to permit anyone, right? It's easy to get on the easy road. You don't really have to do anything. There's no limit to what you can take with you. There's no TSA to check your luggage or to measure it or weigh it or anything like that. You don't have to leave any of your bags behind. You can take all of your evil thoughts with you. You can take all of your bad habits with you. You can take all of your wicked associations with you. You can take with you all your sins, all your self-will, all your pride. That can easily fit through that wide gate. And you can even take with you anyone that you can persuade to come along. Your friends, your family, your neighbors, you could bring them too. There's enough room. But the gate opening onto the hard road is different. It's narrow. You have to look to find it. And in order to enter it, you can't take anything with you. It won't fit. You've got to leave everything behind. Everything behind. Sin, selfishness, greed, lust, pride. And what's more, this gate, it's like a turnstile or a turnpike gate, people have to enter it one by one. You can show people the way, 
but you can't bring them with you. You have to enter this gate alone. Well, how can we find this narrow gate? How can we find the hard road? You look at another passage outside of the Gospel of Matthew. Look at John chapter 10. John chapter 10 in verse 9. And Jesus says simply, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Different metaphor, but similar, right? It's talking about the sheep coming in. Jesus is the entrance. How about one more? John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus says he's going away. His disciples say, uh, you know, we don't know the way. How, how, how are we going to know the way to get to you? And Jesus says to him in verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Remember how we began that Jesus is so unique, he's so different than anyone else? All the other world religions, they have their kind of version of paradise or heaven or something like that, but they point to a system This is what you must do to whatever, achieve enlightenment or nirvana or get to paradise or heaven. The eightfold path of enlightenment, the five pillars of Islam, do these things in this order and maybe if you're good enough, God, if there is one, will let you in. But the gospel doesn't point to a system. The gospel points to a person, his words, his accomplishments, what he has done. And the only thing preventing us from entering through this gate is our sin. And that's the very reason that Jesus came down from heaven to earth to be born into this world, ultimately to to die on the cross for us. In his body, on the tree, on the cross, he bore our sins so that we would die to this wicked life, right? And we would live to righteousness. So before we can enter through the narrow gate and begin our journey on the road that leads to life, we have to go through Christ himself. And I'm not going to repeat everything that Tip said last week, but I will direct you to that sermon because he explains exactly how you do that. But just briefly, this is the significance of baptism. If you believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that this is the entrance onto that road that that, that leads you toward life, that he is life itself, then immersion into him, into his death where he shed his blood, into his life, that's the only way that our sins can be forgiven and we can be restored into a right relationship with with God. So there's a way back to God from the dark paths of sin. There's a door that is open, and you may go in. In fact, anyone can come in. Anyone who has faith can come in. At Calvary's cross is where you begin when you come as a sinner to Jesus. Let's capitulate here. There are two roads. There are not three. There are not many. There are two. One is easy, the other is hard. There's no middle way. There are two gates. One is wide, the other is narrow. There's no other gate. There are two crowds of people. One is very large, the other is small. There's no neutral way to go through this life. You're either part of one or the other. And there are only two destinations, destruction and life. There's no third option. This is either going to be ridiculous to you or very profound. Jesus is presenting the highest stakes proposition imaginable. There is eternal life to gain or to lose depending on our choice. But I want you to see that the loss of eternal life, it's far more than just forfeiting the reward. It is not just forfeiting eternal life, it's the inheritance of destruction and all that goes along with it. On the other hand, the gain is far more than a consolation of the life that we lost on earth. It's the restoration 
of a life that we've, we've lost and, and much, much more than that. God promises to give us the life that we never had on earth because of its imperfections, because of its brokenness and its tragedies. That's eternal life. Eternal life in a perfect body. Aren't you tired of your body? All the older people are saying yes. Aren't you tired of your own imperfections? All you honest people are saying yes. Don't you want to be closer to God? All you faithful people are saying yes. May God open our ears to the cry of Jesus. Enter by the narrow gate that leads to life. If you've never done that, we pray for you. We, we, we want to help you. If you've never come to Christ, maybe this is the time. And I understand this is uncomfortable. Every Christian has been in the very same position you are. Very hard to swallow your pride. But do you see the truth? Do you see the beauty in these words? Do you see Jesus? Can you hear him? Enter by the narrow gate. Inherit eternal life. It's for you. It's for me. It's for everybody. If you need to respond to the gospel, come forward as we stand and sing.